A little, uh, a little something I'd like to lay on y'all. If you bear with me, uh, we're gonna do a little march right along through now. It's a, uh, it's a love march. We uh, don't carry no guns and things in this army we got. Stuff. Welcome, so folks, to the Penny Stamps Distinguished yeah. Speaker Series. Yeah. Uh, it's so bizarre yeah. in here without the organ, yeah. uh, I know. And it's right coming now. in, I think, two or three weeks. We should have the yeah. organ yeah. back, yeah. working yeah. better than ever. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and supposedly, it won't have to be messed with for another hundred years. So the wait will be worth it. Uh, my name is Christina Hamilton, I'm the series director, and I'm thrilled that we are at the top of what promises to be a dynamic season. Uh, we have uh, an interesting and challenging roster of guests to inspire you, uh, details all of which are listed in the new season calendar, which is available in the lobby. You should pick one up or two on your way out. You can find us online at pennystampsevents.org, where you can sign up to receive our weekly email announcements, uh, or you can join us on Facebook at Penny Stamps Speaker Series and plan to be here most every Thursday. And note, we do have four special special events uh, this fall that are not on Thursdays and not at the Michigan Theater. So make sure that you read carefully. Uh, today we present cyborg artists, uh, Neil Harbison and Moon Rebus, with an international performance scaling across time and space. Uh, this is because due to unforeseen circumstances and challenges, Neil Harbison was unfortunately unable to travel here physically uh, to be with us in person. And even so, he will still be joining us today from Switzerland. Uh, this is, I believe, the first series event uh, uh, and also the first for the cyborgs, where we are, uh, you know, phoning it in across the land. So may the fairies or the force be with us. Uh, I want to thank our partners for their support of today's program, the Dissonance Event Series, uh, the School of Information, and our series partners, Arts Engine and 91.7 FM. Yay! I like it that you like them. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A today with Moon, so if you would like to uh, speak with Moon and have questions for her, I'm sure you'll have some burning questions. Uh, we're going to do that in the screening room. There is a, another event pressing hard on our heels to take over this space after, so you know, if you don't know where the screening room is, exit the doors, go left down the hallway. Uh, before you get to the bathrooms, there's another sort of lobby. Turn to your right and you'll find the screening room. Uh, and please do remember to turn off your cell phones. Uh, being the opening event of the season, I'm going to offer you a few thoughts, as I usually do, on our season theme, which is gather. Uh, this is gather as in all the different and various forms of gather, which are very interesting, and I'm not going to go through all of them today, just a few. But gather as in to come together in a group, assemble or aggregate, just as we're gathered here for this platform featuring creators and innovators from all corners of the globe. Let us not forget how precious the right to gather is, especially for free, uh, as in today, but uh, that to assemble as such is not legal in all times and places. And there is a reason it is the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights which provides us the right of people to assemble. Uh, today we open the season with some very interconnected folks who bring ideas to bear regarding gathering humans together with technology. Uh, this is another sense of gather as in to draw close to oneself or gathering the folds as pulling a thread through cloth, collapsing time and space by running a thread through us and gathering us together with the planet. Uh, our knowledge and our concept of our planet's size, its girth, it's become much, much smaller, certainly in my lifetime, uh, and it becomes smaller still through the advancements of technology and our ability to transpose space and time as we do business in an instant across the globe, or as we will invite Neil remotely here to be with us today. The Earth is also itself becoming physically smaller as we face the challenges of climate change, rising seas, and receding shorelines. We will have less inhabitable land. 
the space will be smaller, so much so that we must literally gather closer together. So as we gather here, unified, I hope, in an effort to explore, discover, and connect, I hope that this season will bring us each a deeper understanding of our interconnectedness, not just to each other, but to all that is around us. <sighs> Enough of that. And now to introduce our guest, guests, I should say. We have someone very fitting and someone who's hard at work for all of you uh, and whom you should know. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce you to him. He is the university's chief information security officer. Uh, when not working with his team on matters related to the security of the university's systems and privacy and data, uh, he convenes dissonance a multidisciplinary group of faculty and students that explore issues at the confluence of technology, pri policy, privacy, security, and law. And sometimes, like today, even the arts. So please welcome to the stage, Saul Berman. Good afternoon, everybody. So there are so many things I love about the University of Michigan, but let me tell you a little bit about my short list. There's the cube, sadly a little hidden away for a while longer. There's the bell tower, the band taking the field, and there's this, the Penny Stamp Speaker Series. All of these, for me, evoke memories and stir emotions. The first three are never changing, and, and in its own way, Penny Stamps is, this, is perpetual as well. It is always different, and as importantly, always challenging and provocative. Tonight is no different than that. Catalan-based artists, self-identified cyborgs, and influencers in the global cyborg art movement, Neil Harbison, Harbison and Moon Rivas use the internet as a sense to fuel perception, understanding, and its self-expression. Both artists explore the boundaries between cybernetics and organism, defend the freedom of self-design, and believe that embracing our non-human entities can bring us closer with the organic worlds of animals, nature, and even the cosmos. Together, Rivas and Harbison advocate on behalf of cyborgs worldwide through the Cyborg Foundation. Founded in 2010, the foundation is committed to the self-actualization of cyborg identities, trans species rights, and the promotion of cyborg art. An avant-garde artist, Rivas is best known for developing Seismic Sense, an online seismic sensor implanted in her feet that allows her to perceive earthquakes taking place around the world and even on the moon, all through vibrations in real time. With an antenna implanted in his skull, Harbison, Harbison's creative expression extends to his physical body as well, with the focus of his work dedicated to the exploration of identity, perception, the connection between sight and sound, and the use of artistic expression via new sensory inputs. Both of them ask us to consider what separates human beings from the technology we create and use. Today's program will begin with a performance of seismic data collected over the past 50 years from the earthquakes which have taken place here in the US. Moon will play back the data so we can all hear how the country has been moving. Please welcome to the stage, Moon Rivas.
88. Nineteen eighty-two. Six. Nineteen ninety seven. Nineteen ninety eight. Nineteen ninety nine. 2001 2002 2003 2004 2005 2006 2007 2008 2009 2010 2011 2012 2013 2014 2015 2016 2017 2018 2019 Thank you. Now, 
have to give a talk. Wait, I'm going to drink some water first. <laughs> I don't know how that felt to you, but it felt intense for me. So this is, was like yeah, an interpretation of how your country had been moving for the last 50 years. So in this piece, Earth was actually the composer of the piece, and I was just interpreting the, um, the data that I collected. So I'll, I'll start, uh, I'll explain to you how, how I got to the cyborg world. So I, there are many things that happen around us that we cannot perceive because our senses are limited. And there are many, so, and we perceive the outside world through the senses that we have. But depending on the senses that you have, you, the world that you perceive can be differently. There are many things that happened around us that we, that, we don't, that we don't get. And I learned that if I unite myself with technology or using technology, I could perceive all these imperceptible things that were happening around me and I couldn't, and I couldn't perceive it. And uh, I'll start from the beginning though, because I'm actually a dancer. I studied choreography. I was studying dance in, in England. And while I was studying dance, I was encouraged to use technology in, in my work. And actually, when I grew up, I was uh, very hippie and actually I was very anti-technology. I, I always felt that uh, it was very cold and distant. And then I realized that instead of using technology as a tool, if I use technology as an experience of the dance, maybe it would, more, it would be a more natural connection. Also, when, when I was studying uh, choreography, I learned that um, instead of creating movement, that it's what usually do as a dancer, you can also find movement. And that ma there's many things that move around us that we don't perceive. Uh, and then I realized that if I unite myself with technology, I could perceive all this imperceptible movement that I cannot perceive with my natural senses. So I started doing uh, several projects. And my first project was this kind of glove. And I, uh, and I wanted to perceive the speed of the people walking in front of me. So I created this glove, and I would actually point at people, and depending on the speed of the people walking in front of me, I would know if someone was walking three per hour, or four per hour, or five per hour. But this had some inconvenience, because I had to point at people, and that was kind of weird and rude. <clears throat> and then also, maybe a bit antisocial, and then also I had um, this this glove actually gave me the information. It would tell me if someone was walking three per hour or four per hour, but I didn't want to know the speed. I wanted to feel the speed. So in order to, be, to, to, in order to transform this tool to a sense, um, with the help of an engineer, I transformed this glove into a pair of earrings. And it was uh, something like this. So I had two, uh, two earrings in my ears, and when someone was walking from right to left, I would feel a vibration on my right ear, and then, so someone was walking, and then I would feel a vibration in my right ear, uh, right ear and then on my left ear, and depending, depending on the interval of each vibration, I would know the, peop the speed of the people walking in front of me. So I was de uh, um, developing the sense of a speed. Um, and then when I was wearing this for some, for some time, I realized that uh, we, like society, as a, as a, we have like a common movement sense. You probably will walk faster, maybe if you are in New York, than if you are in Austin. I just relate these two places because I've been there. So, uh, so this like this common movement sense because we tend to, to, to how to say like to. To, to get along with the other ones. So in order to do, uh, I started a project where I would define uh, the speed, the average speed of each capital city of Europe. Because I don't know if you've been to Europe, but uh, I realize that people walk faster if they are in London, for example, than if they are in Rome. So I created like a movement dictionary where I interpreted all the, all the speed of the people walking in the city, in the, in the different capitals. This was one project. So after, uh, after exploring this sense for some time, 
Um, then I decided to turn around my earrings, and this actually helped me to perceive what I had, what I had behind my body. All our senses are focused in the front of our body, so we, we know what's going on what's going on in front of our bodies, but in the back of our bodies we are very dead sensory speaking. We, we don't really perceive what's going on behind. And I don't know if this happens in an arbor, probably not because you have big, big streets, but in Europe we have very narrow streets, especially in Barcelona, and I get very nervous when someone is walking very slow and I want to go in front of them. I don't know if that happens to you. So I think everyone should have these senses and and then probably the way that you move to cities would be would be different. So like, and it's actually some a sense that we give to cars because cars now they can sense if they're getting closer to another object. But actually, we as humans we don't know if we can get closer to an, if a person is coming from behind or not. So if we all had this sense, maybe our weight of moving to the cities would be different. Maybe new sports would appear because you can you can sense differently what's what's around you. So it was like a 360 three perception, what, uh, what I did. And after experiencing the movement that I had around, suddenly I wanted to perceive a more universal movement. I, I thought um, that I want to perceive a movement that it didn't depend on people. And I thought, if I would be alone in the planet, how could I perceive movement? Well, and movement is not only a human thing. And I realized that actually, the Earth is constantly moving, not only rotates by itself or on the sun, but it shades constantly through earthquakes. And then I thought it would be amazing to be united to this huge and natural movement uh, that most of the time is imperceptible for us, and being united this through, through my own body. And this is when I created the seismic sense, the sense of, of being united to the natural movement of the Earth. So for several years, I had some implants in my feet, that were connected to online seismographs. And whenever there was an earthquake anywhere in the planet, I would feel vibration inside my body. So if I was now here in Michigan, but there was an earthquake in California, or in Japan, or in Greece, I would feel a vibration inside my body. And, and this is what I call the seismic sense, a sense of feeling the seismic activity. Of course, I had to get used to feeling all these vibrations constantly, because the Earth is very alive and it moves a lot. So at the beginning, uh, if I was talking to someone, I would feel a vibration, I would stop talking or get very distracted. Maybe when I was sleeping, I would wake, uh, wake up more often because of all these vibrations. Uh, I have to say that I sleep actually very, very deep, so it worked for me. I got used to it very fast. Maybe if someone who has trouble sleeping wouldn't work that well for them. But um, yeah, so I had this extra bit inside my body and a way that I had to describe it is like I felt like I had two heartbeats now, like uh, I have two beats, my heartbeat and the earth beat, having its own rhythm inside my body. And we, we see this as cyborg art, the art of creating your own senses. So we feel that now artists, we no longer need to use technology as a tool. We can use technology as part of our body and change our perception of reality as an artwork. So the artwork of a cyborg artist would be the creation of a new sense. I see this seismic sense as my artwork, but the, the problem with cyborg art, or like the inconvenience of it, is that it's an artwork that happens inside the artist. So in a way, I'm the only audience of my own art because it happens inside myself and I'm the only one perceiving it. So in order to share what I feel, I create external artwork. And one of the pieces that I have, it's called Waiting for Earthquakes. And this is like a durational dance piece. It's like a waiting room where I propose to the audience that we wait together. So I'm just standing still in, in a place, and whenever there's an earthquake, I move according to the intensity of the earthquake. Uh, so it's a durational piece. It can last 10 minutes, or it can last hours. Um, and, and yeah, and in this piece, Earth is the, co is the choreographer of the piece, and I'm just interpreting the data that she gives me. Uh, so if during the performance there is no earthquakes, there will be no dance. A lot of festivals are worried about this when they contract me. But it's, just, it's not my fault, it's Earth that it doesn't want to dance. But um, usually Earth is very live, so there's always something happening. Um, another way that I have to share it is 
through the seismic percussion that we just experienced. So Earth is the composer of the piece and and the rhythm and intensity of the piece, it's based on the, on the movement of the tectonic plates. This is like, a score, this is like the score that I create uh, based on the seismic activity that happened in a specific place. Um, and yeah, so in, in 2010, Neil and I uh, co-founded the Cyborg Foundation when uh, uh, basically with three aims. One was to help people to become a cyborg. The other one was to promote cyborg art as an artistic movement. And the other one was to defend the cyborg rights. The right and the freedom to be able to design yourself, to decide how, uh, how many organs or what organs and sensors do you want to have. Actually, the, the word cyborg was created by Nathan Kleins and Manfred Kleins. It was created to describe people that would that will have to modify themselves in order to survive in space. So he, they thought instead of creating a spaceships and explore space and you have to live inside these spaceships, we should be able to modify ourselves in order to survive in other environments. We think that maybe we should modify ourselves in order to understand better the planet we live in. So we, we kind of like this word cyborg, but then since it, been, it has been created, it has been uh, used in many ways, in, especially in science fiction movies. Now we think that being a cyborg is an identity. Uh, and from the Cyborg Foundation we thought, okay, maybe there's like three ways of identifying yourself as a cyborg or being a cyborg. We thought one could be a psychological cyborg, which is the feeling of being united to technology. Maybe most of you are already psychological cyborgs. When your mobile phone is running out of battery, you say, I'm running out of battery, instead of saying, my mobile phone is running out of battery. So we kind of all psychologically connected to technology. One could be a biological cyborg, which is the physical union between yourself and, the, and technology. And one could be a neurological cyborg, which is the modification of the mind and the brain because you've been united to technology. And now, after this, I, re I actually came out, or I realized that there's another way of being a cyborg. This is, I haven't told much this yet, because it's very recent, but since a month ago, I actually took out the implants in my feet. I've been, wearing, I've been having these implants for many years inside the feet, but then I, I realized that I wanted to experience movement in another way, so I took them out. And I realized that maybe now I am a phantom cyborg. Because even if uh, it's very recent, so it's been like a month or something, but when I took them out, I could still feel the earthquakes because I've been having these implants for so long that I could still feel the, the sensation. So I thought it was very similar, you know, like the people that lose an arm and they still feel that they have the arm. So I have this feeling with a, with a sense. I don't have the implants anymore, but I, I still have the feeling of feeling the, the sense of feeling the vibrations. It, pro, it will probably go away with the years, but for now, I feel that I'm a phantom cyborg. It's something that I realized uh, not long ago. This is when I took them out. And, and all the projects that we did with, uh, with Neil, this was like my experience with all the cybernetics, but other, other projects that we did with Neil was, um, I, we were invited to Brazil to do a project for a, for a week with very talented engineers. And actually, I, I had a tooth missing. Well, I still have a tooth missing. And Neil had two tooth missing. So we, we proposed to the people to make a tooth that it would do something a bit different. So a tooth was implanted in my mouth, and the other tooth was implanted in Neil's mouth, and whenever he clicked, I would feel a vibration, and whenever I click, he would feel a vibration. And we both know the Morse code, so we were actually to communicate from mouth to mouth by clicking, uh, by, by, yeah, by, the, by clicking the vibrations. And we did like a little demonstration, uh, so I was sitting at the end of the table and Neil in the other end and the audience would write a, a word to me and then I would be like and then he would write it and then it was the first try out uh, of this system and we call this system the transcendental communication system because we were communicating from, uh, from tooth to tooth and it was actually a system that it worked with Bluetooth so it was actually a Bluetooth tooth and that's now <laughs> we like this, this is also the poetry. Uh, I want to tell something more about it. Uh, 
Uh, okay, yeah, I think that's it. It was, no, no, no. And then, uh, yeah, this also. Neil had uh, two, two spaces in the mouth, and he decided to put a light tooth in the other space. Uh, to, to have light by himself, because it's the bioluminescence. Uh, the problem is that it also worked with by clicking, so whenever he was eating, the light was on and off all the time. So we have to find another system to have bio, bio, light by himself. But yeah, we're working on it. Uh, another project, this is, we did a, a workshop in the south of France, and this is a project by a student. Actually, this part of the body is called solar plexums. And this student designed a prototype uh, to, to have here like an implant that it will tell you the heat of the sun because the sun changes the heat and it has solar flares. So this, this implant will tell you and it will connect you to the sun and to his heat, this uh, heat. This is like magnetic hair. So I don't know if there are any balls in the, in the theater, but maybe this will <laughs> be your interest. Um, so this is like, we thought that this could be an implant uh, with, that you could feel the magnetic, the magnetic fields around you. So if you go plus to a fridge, you have move, it would move around. Uh, we went to Colombia to, to, to give a talk and we met the mayor and the mayor was actually very interested in this. So maybe he will be the first cyborg mayor with a cybernetic uh, hair implant. Another, ah yeah, this is Manel. This is an artist from Barcelona. And he was very interested in, uh, with the weather and the rain. So he's creating this new sense, these new implants, that it will be this type of things, uh, that it will tell him he can perceive the atmospheric pressure. And if you know the atmospheric pressure, you can know if it's going to rain, or if it's going to be sunny, and the temperature. So he's actually the weatherman. He can feel the weather with this new sense. Uh, and in Barcelona, uh, with Neil, we have this lab. Uh, the Cyber Foundation Labs we have the, uh, in the studio, and we're creating new sensors. Uh, Phoenix Binario is the engineer who helped us to, to create and to, and to create other sensors for other people and other artists. And some of them, for example, is the air quality sense, so it's a sense to know the quality of the air around you, and actually this would help you to, if you, if you know the, air, the quality of air, Maybe if you live in a very polluted place, you will choose the less polluted way to go, to go home. Uh, another sense is the ultraviolet uh, sense from Pau. The cosmic sense, the cosmic rays, this is also an artist from Barcelona who wants to perceive the, the cosmic rays, the rays are growing from space to, to the earth with the sound. Echolocation, this is uh, similar from uh, to perceive what's behind, but actually he has an uh, upgraded version of mine. He can, he can perceive what's behind, but also if it's a person or just an object through the temperature, he would know if it's a life or, or not object. This is a, a project that we did, uh, Neil, Manel, and I. Um, this is actually doesn't have cybernetics, it's a bit an alternative project that we did. Actually, this, this, this theory that we, uh, before humans uh, used to know where the North is by ourselves, and we used, uh, and this like some theory that we used to know it in the back of our knees, we could feel uh, the North in, in that part of the body. So we did a tryout, and we, we put a compass in that part of the body to see if we could wake up this dormant sense, to see if it was like an experiment. And we wore it for some months to see if we could wake up this sense. Uh, we didn't, actually. This was, but it was an experiment. I think Neil and Manel still had it, has it, have the implant. I took, the, I took it out. Maybe it will wake up. Uh, actually, this, all these senses, I want to say, um, it relates everything to the outside world. We, it helps us to understand the planet we live in. Uh, and, and actually, these senses doesn't make us feel closer to robots or to machines. That uh, Now that I feel that I'm a cyborg, uh, I actually feel closer to the planet, to the Earth, and other animals, than actually to technology and to, uh, to machines. We also think that we can get very inspired by, by the senses that other, other animals have. Sometimes we don't need to imagine things like science fiction or, or things that are unreal. If we take a look at nature, 
we can think that something, sometimes what we think is very unnatural is actually very natural. For example, some bees can perceive the ultraviolet, uh, the birds can fly, um, this infrasound, some animals can perceive infrasound, they can perceive the heat. Um, uh, even immortality already exists in nature because there's a jellyfish that never dies and keeps regenerating. So I think we can get very inspired by the senses and how other animals live in our planet. And we call this actually revealed reality with these new senses. We don't think that we do virtual reality or augmented reality. We feel that we are revealing a reality that is actually around us, but we don't perceive. So creating these new senses is like revealing a reality that it's, it's in front of us, but we cannot perceive it. Also, uh, as the experience all this, um, we're actually, me, after feeling earthquake for so many years, I realized that actually it doesn't make sense to build all these big cities at the edge of the tectonic plates that are actually very dangerous places to live. We feel that maybe uh, we have arrived on time that but for many, many, many years, humans have been changing the planet in order to live more comfortable, but maybe we have arrived on a time that it's better to change ourselves, to design ourselves, and to stop designing the planet in order to be more comfortable. Maybe we have arrived on a time that we should modify ourselves in order to adapt better and to understand better the planet we live in. Like, for example, the earthquakes, I don't think it makes sense to make big cities at the edge of the tectonic plates that are actually very dangerous places to live. Maybe the animals wouldn't do that. Or also, Instead of creating artificial light, we can, we can uh, create night vision and, uh, and stop using artificial and, and wasting so much electricity and actually have half of the planet dark at night and not from, uh, having so much electricity. Also, if we had our own temperature, we wouldn't need to heat up or cool down the, the planet itself. We can regulate ourselves and leave the planet a bit in peace. And uh, also the, la the last project I want to comment, um, uh, when I had the implants, I also uh, connected to the moon, to the seismic activity uh, of the moon, because the moon also has moonquakes and it shakes every now and then. And actually this connection with uh, planets outside, uh, outside the Earth, we call this to be a astronaut. We feel that we no longer need to be an astronaut and go physically in a space in order to explore it. We can remain on Earth and have extra sensors uh, to explore space that is probably more comfortable. And uh, now, Neil, will we'll do... Now, Neil, I think we will we'll connect with Neil, and then he will talk about his senses. Hi, Neil! <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't be here, um, but I'll be giving my talk cytogenetically, so it's very side work of me to be with you cytogenetically. Um, so, Moon, you will pass the slides. I yes, guess. just and a I'll talk about. Um, well, I'll continue with what Moon said. My, in my case, my interest was not movement. My interest was color, so I was interested in extending my perception of color because I was born completely colorblind. So I've always seen in grayscale, uh, and uh, as a child, I tried to ignore the existence of color, but it was impossible for me to ignore the existence of color because even if you don't see color, you can't ignore that color exists because people who see color keep mentioning it every single day. So. I would hear words blue, pink, yellow every day, and I couldn't ignore the existence of color. Um, so, some of the examples. Do you, can you see the slides? No, no? Yes. Ah, yeah. Some of the examples are here just the yellow pages, for example, Bluetooth, the Red Cross, Greenpeace, Blue Tack, uh, Red Bull, Pink Panther, the Green Card, James Brown, it's in his surname here or this huge country called Greenland. So it was really impossible for me to ignore color. Uh, also when color is used as a code, it can be confusing. Sometimes hot water and cold water is only expressed through color, or maps are also using codes. This is fine if I go to Lisbon, but if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost. 
because some maps really depend on color. Then when I was a child and I was trying to learn colors of flags, I had this situation. So France, Ireland and Italy share exactly the same flag. Or if I was talking to people um, like this, if someone would ask me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes and dressed in pink? I would have no idea because the only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes and that he's not naked, basically. So I wanted to sense color because it's a social element. I didn't want to change my sight. Uh, to me, seeing grayscale has many advantages. I can see better at night. I can detect camouflages more easily uh, because uh, color doesn't distract me from seeing the shape of things. And also photocopies are cheaper in black and white. So there are advantages in seeing grayscale. So uh, when I was interested in color, I found this theory by Isaac Newton that says and relates each color of the rainbow to a musical note. So I was really interested in this, and uh, Isaac Newton was right. Each color of the rainbow, uh, each color that exists, has a frequency, and these frequencies could be related to sounds. Isaac Newton had no way of detecting the vibrations of color, but now knowledge allows us to know the vibration of each color. So I started this project in 2003 at university, uh, in order to create a system to hear the vibrations of color. And the first system was a webcam, a five kilo computer and, a, and a headphones. And then I was able to hear the colors around me. And this is how colors sound like. Um, so if we could hear the vibrations of color, we would hear these frequencies. So I learned the vibrations of each color, and then when I was able to distinguish all the visual spectrum, then I didn't see why I should stop there, because there's more colors that exist that go beyond the human perception. So I included infrared and ultraviolet perception in the system, so from that moment I was able to perceive more colors than a human eye. Sensing infrared is interesting because it allows me to know if there's movement detectors in a room, so I can go to a shop or a bank and tell if the alarms are on or off, and in many cases they are off, because the infrareds are not working. Or ultraviolet perception allows me to feel if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. So if I sense there's a high level of ultraviolet, I avoid the sun. So this was uh, my sense of color, but then I didn't want to use technology to sense color. I wanted uh, not even to wear technology to sense color. I wanted to become technology to sense color, so I wanted to create a new body part. First, I thought of creating a third eye in the middle of my forehead, but then I thought that maybe the best way to sense color would be through an antenna, because antennas allow me to sense color 360 degrees, so I can be looking in front, but I could be sensing the colors behind. So the aim was to create an antenna that would be implanted in my head, and the antenna would allow me to feel the vibrations of color inside my skull without having to block my ears. So by entering the vibrations in the bone, I would feel and hear the vibrations of color. So when we finished the design of the antenna, I went to the doctor and I said I wanted an antenna implant. And he said no. But then in the end, he said, well, OK, uh, but uh, we had to do the surgery. Uh, not with an, an, an anonymous doctor. You just saw the, the surgery there. This is my head facing down, and my head was drilled four times for four different implants. Um, one is this chip that vibrates depending on the color vibration, and the other chips uh, are for a wireless connection, which I'll talk afterwards. So the antenna and my skull merge, so now the antenna is part of my skeleton, which means that I'm also officially taller now, because it's part of my body. So um, this is my brain as well. The union between the cybernetics, the software, and the brain has created a new sense, which I call the sonochromatic sense. So I also now feel that I'm a cyborg, a biological cyborg, and a psychological cyborg. And this is what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004, because they didn't allow me to renew my passport. There's a law that says that you're not allowed to appear in passport photos with electronic uh, elements. I told them the antenna is not an electronic element, it's a body part. So uh, it should be allowed in passports, and then in the end they allowed me to appear in the passport. So 
this helps me travel freely now. Now I'm conversation in conversation with the Swedish government because the materials that I use to create the antenna are Swedish, so I told them that I am Swedish, so I think that I should be uh, entitled to become a Swedish citizen, uh, but they still haven't replied, so I'm just waiting. So having a new sense has changed many things uh, in daily life, so uh, now I can dress in a way that it sounds good, I can dress in silence, I can dress in C major and A minor, or I can dress as a song, I can decide what colors to wear, and this might sound like a, a melody. Also, hearing music has changed, because now when I hear music, I perceive different colors, so I can paint what I hear. This is Mozart's Queen of the Night, note by note, from the middle to the end. So when I look at this painting, I actually hear uh, Mozart's Queen of the Night. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, which looks very different from Mozart, because they use very different colors. Also, voices can be transposed to color. This is Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream, transposed to color. And also, this new sense can be used in gastronomy. So, uh, we've collaborated with a restaurant where you can go to this restaurant and then you can also hear the sound of the food that is placed on a plate. And then, when you rotate the plate, you hear the melody. So, you can go to this restaurant and uh, eat some songs, like and Lady Gaga dessert or whatever you want. So the, the chef becomes a composer. Uh, also, a, a big change in my life is the, is the way I perceive people. When I look at someone's face, now I hear their face. So I really enjoy creating sound portraits. So I get close to someone's face and then I listen to the sound of the eyes, lips, skin and hair. And then I send them an MP3 of their face. The first uh, sound portrait I did was of Prince Charles. I asked him if I could listen to his face. And this was his reaction when I asked him. We all sound different. Uh, Marina Abramovic sounds very silent, very low frequencies, and very deep. Um, Macaulay Culkin sounds C major, so he has a major chord in his face. Uh, Philip Glass sounds very microtonal, almost like his music. Uh, Robert De Niro has a, a melody in his lips because he has different shades of red in his lips. James Cameron has a very high-pitched sound of skin. And uh, Steve Wozniak has very pure sound in his eyes, a very pure note, an A, like a tuning fork. And Bono had very loud glasses here. But what really shocked me is, through all these years, I've realized that people who say they're black, they're not black. And people who say they're white, they're not white. Uh, people who say they're black, they're actually very, very dark orange. And people who say they're white, they're actually very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false. We are all orange. <laughs> you'll see an example of a, a, a face. Yeah, I don't know, maybe not. We'll do it later. Um, so having an antenna in my head has created a lot of social reactions, uh, and it's interesting to see how these reactions have changed. In 2004, most people thought this was a reading light, so people would ask me if I could turn on the light. In 2005, six people thought it was a flexible microphone. Uh, in 2007, people thought it was a hands-free phone. In 2009, people thought it was a GoPro cam, so people would wave at me, thinking that I was filming them. In 2012, 13, people thought I had something to do with Google Street View uh, and that I was working for Google. In 2015, people, well, especially children, asked me if this was some kind of selfie stick attached to my head. And in 2016, many people shouted at me, Pokemon, and they tried to catch me. So it's changed what people think it is. Hopefully in the 2020s, people will just think it's a new sensory organ. As Moon said, we can start using the internet to explore space through new senses. I use my internet connection in my head to connect to NASA's International Space Station, and when I do this, I can sense 
colors from space. But I also use the internet connection to receive colors from five friends. So I have five friends in the world that have permission to send colors to my head. So uh, now I'm here in Switzerland, but people uh, from Japan can actually send colors directly to my head. And then this allows me to have an eye in each continent and to extend my perception of color beyond my continent or beyond Earth. So my current project is to have a new implant in my head that will allow me to sense the passage of time. We all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ for time. So it will be, actually it's here, it's this circular um, crown that goes around the head. Uh, this is the first prototype, but it will eventually be implanted. And it's a point of heat that goes slowly around the head, and it allows me to feel where the sun is. If you go to the next slide, Moon, there's new slides here now. Uh, this is, if I feel the point of heat in the middle of my forehead, it means it's 12 o'clock solar time in London. If you go to the next, if I feel it in my right ear, it means it's uh, the sun is shining where you are in Michigan, so it's 12 o'clock solar time. And then the next one is uh, midnight in London, therefore 12 o'clock solar time in uh, New Zealand, and the next one is the next. So having this organ will allow me to feel the 24-hour cycle, the 24-hour cycle of the planet around my head, and it will allow me to feel time. The aim is not to know what time it is, but to see whether or not in the future I can modify my perception of time. So when my brain gets used to it, I will see if by changing the speed in which the point of heat goes around the head, I can actually change my perception of time. If it happens, we would be able to take into practice Albert Einstein's theory of time relativity. So we could decide if a situation, if you want the situation to last longer, you make the point of heat go faster or slower. Or if you want to travel in time, you can make it spin several times so that you are traveling in time. So it would be able, you would be able to create time illusions. Because if you have an organ for time, we should be able to create time illusions in the same way that we can create optical illusions because we have an organ for sight. So that's my current project. Um, so, yeah, we see this as species design or cyborg art. And um, one of the ways we also define it is um, not artificial intelligence, but artificial sense. If the antenna was telling me the names of colors, that would be AI. But we are not allowing technology to give us intelligence. We are allowing technology to give us a sense. And then through this new sense, through this stimuli, we might or we might not create intelligence in collaboration with the technology. So when you merge with an AS, the intelligence is created by your own brain. Uh, when you merge with AI, the intelligence is given to you by the machine. Um, I think this is... It, uh, I, I was uh, very happy that the technicians made this possible. So I would really like to thank uh, the theater and the organizers that you made possible that I was here. But uh, we also organized something that we've never done before. So this is going to be an experiment. We wanted to, as I said before, there's five people in the world that have permission to send colors to my head. So we thought that we could send one of these people here in Michigan. So now there's someone here in Michigan that has an antenna and can connect to my head. So we thought it would be interesting to do the first live demonstration of an antenna to antenna communication from Michigan to here where I am in Switzerland. So please uh, welcome uh, artist Kim Giron, who will actually be sending colors to my head. Is everything is is it on Moon? I can't hear and Moon. Okay. I, can you can you can you see or move the camera? 
Okay, so now my antenna is connected to... Okay, now my antenna is connected to, to you, and I'm receiving, I'm receiving different colors. Green. Okay. He doesn't hear me if I don't... Are you ready, Neil? Ah, okay. We wait. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready. I, I'm receiving, I'm now connected to you. Okay. So if you can just send some colors. The first one. Okay. Yeah, now I'm receiving C sharp. So it's blue, a very un, unusual blue. <laughs> This is a very weird green. So now I'm here. So the first color was C sharp. This was A. So the note went down. This is the lowest sound now. This is an F. So this is a, a type of red. Red is the lowest color. This is the first color that I ever perceived. And this is G. So this is a, a, a yellow. G is yellow. So, um, to me, this allows me to share a sense with someone. Usually, we don't do it like this. People just, the friends send colors directly to my head without notice. But we thought that uh, we could try out something else now, which is simply uh, try to create a, sound, a face concert. So, I will, from here, amplify the sounds that I receive so that you can hear them. So basically, we need people's faces, and then we'll create a face concert from Michigan to Switzerland. So I'll be receiving the colors of your faces, and I'll be playing them from Switzerland. And if the concert sounds really bad, it's not my fault, because that's where the colors are coming from. So please, Kim, if you can find some faces, and then I'll start playing the faces that I receive. I'll amplify them here on my computer. So this is the first transcontinental face concert done from antenna to antenna. Okay, yeah. So he gets it. So was that the skin, Neil? Sorry. Do you hear yeah. us? Do you hear me? Can you can you hear can you hear this? Yes. Can you hear? Okay. So we <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So what Give was me that some, the skin? Some like lips, maybe lips. I need lips. The sound of lips, because it will sound better, maybe. Okay. Again? 
you you look worried. Ah. Okay. I'm 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 trying to <laughs> amplify. Good. Oh. That sounds. A bit confused here. Let us know what the, what what are the sounds. Should we do another phase, Neil? We do. No. Is it too noisy? No. <laughs> no. We just confused. We don't know what what we are hearing. I'm just adding the colors that I'm receiving. Ah. Okay. Let's find another phase. Look, he wants. He really wants to. <laughs> should we send, what should we send, some hair? Because... What, what do you need? We need communicate, we very... <laughs> you want to do more faces? Yeah, he's now doing another... I'm adding it, I'm adding. It just, you are very big and we all see your re face reaction. Um, <laughs> you look preoccupied. <laughs> I'm very worried. I'm yes. a bit confused. <laughs> we do, I'm we do. Too many colors. <laughs> you, then you, this is a colorful audience. Wow, we look, I think this is a, this is a very interesting color member audience. <laughs> Nia is very confused. Maybe it's because of her. <laughs> this is an interesting... <laughs> no, no, I'm, okay. I know. I'm actually looking at you, so I'm sending your face too. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yep. Thank you. It was a bit confusing for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, so, yeah, thanks a lot for coming. So that was the demonstration of Sayuar. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we can Thank we you. can carry on in the Q and A.